Virginia, November 1967. The basic school at Marine Corps Base Quantico begins teaching the latest batch of newly commissioned officers what it means to be an officer in the Marine Corps. I'm sure some of us were motivated to join the Marine Corps because we would have been drafted, but no, none of us were drafted into the Marine Corps. We were all volunteers. Uh, and uh, despite all you hear, I think most of us were, were quite anxious to, to get involved uh, and uh, to do our part. Looking back, I think that was before the media, the real media frenzy started and before you know, Walter Cronkite announced to the world that we'd lost the war. Because it was prior to Tet. You know, it was prior to Quezon. But those events are on the immediate horizon. In January, as the men of TBS Class 568 continue their second month of training, unexpected critics of the war begin to surface. Just across the Potomac at a White House conference on crime, singer and actress Eartha Kitt denounces the Vietnam War. Meanwhile, more than 8,000 miles away, the North Vietnamese Army lays siege to the remote Marine Corps outpost at Khe Sanh. Just days later, the North launches the countrywide Tet Offensive, with 80,000 troops striking at more than 100 towns and cities, taking Allied forces by surprise. And even as the bullets and bombs wreak havoc in Vietnam, in the U.S., more war protesters gather, using words as their weapons. I think that all of us were aware of what was going on, but uh, we were pretty, pretty well focused on what we were doing at the time. Quint Wortham's commission followed two years of service in the Corps' enlisted ranks, all during a time when the integration of African Americans into a broader range of American society was happening. And though U.S. military leaders touted equality within the services, discrimination was still an issue. There was some However, I think that for the most part, those of us who were in OCS were more enlightened. I saw more of it when I was an enlisted man. As training continues for Quint and his classmates, news of other major events filters in. In February, anti-war sentiment grows as Americans react to the Associated Press photograph of Saigon's police chief executing a Viet Cong prisoner. Then President Johnson announces he will not seek re-election. In April, as graduation nears, they learn of a tragic loss in Memphis, Tennessee. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I was with three other officers coming back from D.C. when we heard on the radio that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And that was very upsetting to me because I knew what would happen in this country. You know, I, I knew the explosion that would cause. The base chaplain came in and addressed our, our class, the topic of a sermon, was a man was killed today. And that man will be buried shortly, and this country will go on. And I thought in some respects he was trivializing the, uh, the death of uh, a great man, a, a man who we didn't really fully appreciate until some years later. While the country mourns, word arrives that the siege of Quezon has finally been lifted, although both sides claim victory. Two days later, the classmates reach their goal, graduation. Additional specialized job training is planned for most. Then, Vietnam. My head and the divisions that exist so deeply within our country and remove, remove the stain of bloodshed. In the summer of 1968, social unrest could be seen and felt across the United States.
The shock of the Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy assassinations was still fresh. If you do not leave, you will be subject to arrest. And there was a growing fear for loved ones fighting a war the majority of Americans were now against. In the midst of it all, thousands of service members, including many graduates of Marine Corps Basic School Class 568, prepared to go join the fight. On my way to Vietnam, I was in San Francisco airport, and because I had gold bars on, there was a group approaching me that had protest signs, and they surrounded me. And there were quite a few. It was because there were people like me willing to stand in harm's way. Second Lieutenant Lar Litzter arrived in Vietnam in July and soon found himself in command of an infantry platoon. During the search and destroy missions on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, if they weren't wearing Marine Corps green or they weren't mountain yards, our objective was to kill them. That was into his tour, an enemy mortar found its mark. I was in a bomb crater with my platoon, and the enemy landed the mortar round underneath me. As I came back to consciousness, the first question, of course, I cried out was to my men, was anyone else hit? And I remember one of the corporals said, sir, we've all been hit. And Lar vividly recalls another corporal's actions that he says really speaks to who Marines are. Several times, this one corporal, whose name was Newbold, Corporal Newbold, kept coming to my side, and I would try to get up, especially when we would get new incoming rounds of mortars. And I tried to get up, and Newbold put, pushed me down, and then he laid across my body, and I said to him, Newbold, go take cover. I could barely whisper. I remember Newbold saying to me, no, sir, I'm staying here. You can't take another hit. picture you just know the ground in front of you so what people reported and how they put it together didn't really see a whole lot you know we didn't have the type of outside world communications they have now most of what you heard was just what I'll call the everyday bitching and moaning you know uh, that we all do for the most part more concern about you know was there something decent to eat or was it possible to get clean or you know things of that type. At the same time, the American public doesn't always hear about the many good things happening in the midst of the war. The terrible things you hear about the war, they're the exception. We were involved in building uh, schools and doing a lot of other things in, in uh, civic action in, in Vietnam that you hear so little about. And that second tour, all I did was work with civilians and we built schools and dispensaries. Yeah, I helped uh, the Marines adopt orphans out of the three orphanages there, and, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. Do solemnly swear. January 1969. Richard Nixon takes office as the new president of the United States. Regarding Vietnam, he aims to negotiate a settlement that will allow the half million U.S. troops in Vietnam to be withdrawn while still allowing South Vietnam to survive. I pledge to you, we shall have an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. Soon after, all hear the sobering news that U.S. combat deaths in Vietnam have exceeded the 33,629 men killed in the Korean War a toll that now includes eight of the 241 graduates of Marine Basic School Class 568.
Quint Wortham's classmates. When I heard that Ron Davidson had been killed, that Bill Jones had been killed, and John Abbott had been killed, it was a wake-up call for me because I knew that if they could kill those guys, they could kill me too. At the time, Lieutenant Worthams was serving in Vietnam as a communications officer in a command position unusual in those times of continued racial strife. In my case, I know there was no place else in the continental United States or perhaps even in the world where a black man could have 65 people reporting to him at 22 years old. And was it an issue being a black officer in command of a white platoon? No, I didn't allow it to become one. November 1969. The American public is shocked and appalled by reports of a massacre at My Lai. Photos show the bodies of hundreds of Vietnamese civilians, men, women, and children, brutally murdered. And the reports say American soldiers are to blame. Soon, there are greater demands to get out of Vietnam. A new year begins. While the battle to end U.S. involvement in Vietnam goes on at home, on a hilltop in Vietnam, Lieutenant Ed Flanagan is serving as a forward air controller. And a lot of Purple Hearts are your own fault, and in this case it was, because we were in a safe bunker, and I thought if, during the motor attack, if I could look outside and see where that muzzle flash was, I could run an airstrike on it, and a mortar round came, and it was a head injury, but with a head injury, you bleed a lot, even though it isn't that serious, but I was really convinced that, that I was going to be dead soon. Spent the night in the bunker and in the morning called in my own medevac. That was in October and I was due to rotate in November and I thought, well, I'm good now. I, I can just take it easy and left the hospital and uh, wound up back on the same hill. And I really didn't want to be there anymore. I just wanted to go home. Two weeks later, Ed got his wish. And over the next year, the majority of the U.S. combat troops in Vietnam follow. By January 1972, only 133,000 remain. In December, peace talks between the U.S. and North Vietnam break down. President Nixon orders the most intense bombing campaign of the war, targeting North Vietnamese factories and ports. Over 12 days, U.S. aircraft dropped more than 20,000 tons of bombs. One month later, peace talks resume, and soon after, President Nixon signs the ceasefire agreement, ending U.S. military involvement in Vietnam. And where do we go from here? On March 29, 1973, the last American combat soldiers leave. South Vietnam must now fend for itself. That caused an emotional turmoil in me like nothing I'd ever experienced in my life. And I knew many, many of us who, if they would have said, get your stuff and go back over there, we're not going to let this happen. I know we'd have gone in a minute. We embrace them and, and say, we'll work with you to achieve this result. And then uh, uh, when, when things become difficult, we say, yeah, well, we're leaving. As a civil affairs officer, I had 53 Vietnamese employees working for me, too. So I was equally concerned about all of those people because I knew what would be done to those people that uh, had fought with us uh, for their freedom. March 29th also saw the last of the known 591 American POWs leave Hanoi. The men are flown to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines and are greeted with cheers. For many Americans, their return marked the final chapter in our country's involvement in the Vietnam War. Over the next seven months, North Vietnamese forces make stunning gains in the South. Without American military aid, the Saigon government is unable to fend off attacks from the North. 
Then, news of North Vietnamese forces at Saigon City Gates triggers a U.S. military evacuation of American citizens and members of the press in the city. But word of the effort leaks, and rescue teams find themselves swarmed by thousands of desperate Vietnamese seeking escape. During the operation's 24 chaotic hours, nearly 1,400 U.S. citizens and 5,600 Vietnamese and third country nationals are lifted to U.S. Navy ships offshore. Ten years later on the anniversary when the media uh, spent an entire month focusing on the fall of Saigon, that drove me into counseling. For many veterans of the Vietnam War, the memories still cause pain. Some relive battles and injuries they suffered. Others recall the loss of close friends. Regardless of the cause, many find comfort in the one location that has come to embody the Vietnam War experience. It was very difficult for me. and I had PTSD, still have it. And after 30 years, in 99, I came here. It was an October morning, and I was the only one here. As I came down, the sun was coming up over the Capitol, and I could see the clouds and the pink from the rising sun on the scalloped clouds, and, and it was just a remarkable setting. As I walked down to the wall and found the names of my comrades and touched them, what I got was that all 58,000 of them were at peace and they were okay. It was us who weren't. And my concern, of course, had been for them. Very cathartic experience. Almost 10 years later, Lar returned to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. for a second visit, along with many other graduates of the basic school class 568. 40 years ago, we first assembled ourselves. Marine Corps officer candidates turned Marine Corps basic school graduates. We became TBS class 5-68, all 241 of us. And now we're assembled again, a goodly number of us, this time to pay our respects to those members of our class who are no longer with us. We're standing in front of the names of eight members of TBS class 568 and in front of the names of thousands of others from that same conflict. We've come to honor our fallen classmates. They were and they are Marine officers, everyone. No matter how many people are here, there's just a presence and it's just an awesome thing. And, and having the widows, having the children of the deceased here with us just made it even more special because we were honoring them as well as their husbands that had died. 58,000 names are inscribed on the wall behind us. Some of those, the names of your classmates. In the poem titled The Wall, written by Tim Murphy, he describes it this way, which I think brings it to light to those of you who knew these men. It goes like this. And every name's a father or a husband or a son, or a daughter or a brother or a cousin to someone. Or a name might be a classmate or a friend, you may recall. There's nearly 60,000 fallen names still wailing at the wall. They had the world before them, and here they were, Marines, ready and willing to fight for freedom and for one another. Every one of them, a patriot, a hero, a Marine. And so are you. So are you. Us 
This ceremony at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was the final event for TBS Class 568's first reunion since their graduation in 1968. The reunion was a chance to renew old friendships. I can tell you this is a momentous event in my life. I've never experienced anything like these last four days. It's a brotherhood that surpasses any and everything that I've ever experienced in my life. It means a lot. I don't think I re realized how much because it, it's not that they're all the closest friends you ever had or this or that, but there is there's something you share. And maybe you haven't thought about it in a long time. Their reunion offered a chance to reflect and honor lost friends. Being able to see those names and etch those names, you know, touch those names, uh, means a lot of different things to different people, but I think it's uh, phenomenal. It's, it's what we need. And gave these Vietnam veterans a chance to let all the fallen know. Somebody still cares that, you know, they're not forgotten.